Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us on a nippy January evening. Um, maybe some of you can remember the, what the weather was like yesterday. Uh, I barely can, but as I, as I thought about, my memory will return. On behalf of the Honors Program and the University Committee on Lectures, I am delighted tonight to welcome back to Ames, Elizabeth Andre. She is not only an Ames graduate, but also a 1998 honors graduate from Iowa State who has degrees in Spanish and international studies. In addition to doing work on a doctorate in education at the University of Minnesota, Elizabeth has been busy completing a 1,200 mile dog sled trek across the Canadian Arctic Baffin Island with a renowned polar explorer Will Steger and a team of Inuit hunters, explorers, and educators. Tonight, Elizabeth will show, share stories, slides, and videos of that trip, including encounters with polar bears, sleds falling through the ice, wonderful thought at this time, <laughs> snowstorms, and mushing a team of 10 huskies through mountain passes and over frozen ocean. She will also recount stories shared by Inuit people living in a rapidly warming climate and offer insights to how we can respond to the challenges of global warming. We are honored tonight to host her as part of Iowa State University's 150th anniversary alumni lecture series. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me tonight in welcoming Elizabeth Andre. Thank you, Dean. I appreciate you all coming out. It's a very cold night tonight. I was walking over from the Honors Building and I was actually wearing the expedition coat that I had up in Baffin and I was happy to have that on. I haven't worn that since I came back from Baffin and uh, I was really happy to have that fur ruff on. So thank you for coming. I, I am going to share with you some stories and I'd like to leave some time at the end for questions. So if you have any questions, please uh, let me know and I, I would be happy to answer them. I wanted to start out with a photo of dogs because that's the thing that most people are interested in when they come to the slideshow. And so I figured if I didn't put up a, a photo of a dog to begin with, maybe some people would get antsy. So this is uh, one of our dogs. So moving on. <laughs> There'll be more dog photos later. Uh, this is our expedition team. It was led by Will Steger. He has been exploring in polar regions for the last 40 years. He was the first person to cross Antarctica. He did that by dog team in 1991. And he went across the Antarctic Peninsula, across the Larsen ice shelves. And then in 2002, those ice shelves, which were about the size of Iowa and maybe a thousand feet thick, collapsed into the ocean in an event that scientists now are linking with global warming. And so Will was seeing events like this that were drastically changing the areas that he had traveled in the last 40 years. And he wanted to be able to share this eyewitness with people. And so that was kind of the, the brainchild uh, of him was this expedition. We also had other people on this expedition who witnessed some global warming. This is Ed Beesters. He's a six-time Everest summiteer, has seen a lot of alpine glaciers receding across the world, and feels passionately about global warming, as well as Sir Richard Branson and Richard Branson's 21-year-old son, Sam. Richard Branson owns the Virgin Empire and has pledged uh, quite a bit of money towards global warming solutions and is looking at technological solutions for global warming. So he and his son were on our expedition. And this is John Stetson. He's a musher who spent a lot of time up in Churchill where there's quite active polar bear populations. Abby Fenton was the other education coordinator. And then we were very fortunate to have three Inuit hunters with us and, and community leaders, Theo Ekumak, Simon Kamenek, and Luki Irut. These men are in their 60s, and they were born at a time when Inuit people did not live in communities. They were still nomadic. And so these men were born in igloos and spent the first at least six years of their life, some of them more, traveling nomadically, hunting caribou, hunting narwhal, seals. And so they really know the land intimately. And when they tell us that the environment is changing and the climate is changing, it's uh, it's very, um, very valuable for, for me to hear their, their stories of how the climate is changing. A quick overview of our route. We trained our dogs in Ely, Minnesota, which is about 11 miles from the Canadian border. And then we loaded our dogs into a truck and drove for three days to Ottawa. From Ottawa, we flew to Calumet, 
which is the capital of the new native territory of Nunavut. This is Baffin Island. It's about one and a half times the size of California. This is the Arctic Circle. So the majority of Baffin Island lies north of the Arctic Circle. We started in February, so there was uh, still a little bit of light where we were, and, and we were south of the Arctic Circle. But uh, as we went on in the expedition, we, we moved towards 24-hour daylight, which was an interesting experience as well. Here's a, a close-up of Baffin Island. Again, we started in the Calumet. We crossed over land, also over ocean, and visited Inuit communities along the way. And I'd like to address some of the questions that, that typically come up. A lot of people have misconceptions in their head about what the Arctic is. And the first misconception, a lot of people think the Arctic is flat and white and featureless. And there's actually big mountains up there. Some of the largest cliff faces in the world are on Baffin Island, and they attract base jumpers and big wall climbers and skiers and other adventurers. They're very remote. This uh, particular mountain range is in Oweatook National Park, and it's a traditional route that Inuit have traveled for thousands of years. We were very fortunate to be able to travel through this pass because of this mountain here, Mount Thor, has a glacier here, the Fortbeard Glacier, that's been actively studied by glaciologists at the University of Ottawa. And everyone was excited for us to go through and take photos to see how, how the glacier was doing now. Here's some photos that the University of Ottawa has taken over the years. 1954, you can see the glacier comes down almost to the base of the valley. And then by 75, it had retreated quite a ways up the slope. And as you can see, when we came through, you can just barely see it. And, and this is in the winter, so you, you would expect that maybe it would be a little bit further down, down the valley than it was. Another uh, misconception that people have about the Arctic is that no one lives there. A lot of people think it's just this vast, empty wilderness. Uh, to the contrary, the Inuit people have been living there for a long time. It depends on who you ask how long they've been there. If you ask the Inuit people themselves, they'll tell you that they've always been there. If you look at carbon dating, maybe they've been there for about 4,000 years. And they've been camping and hunting in much the same way that they do today. A uh, very continuous culture. These two hunters brought some seals out to our expedition for us to feed our dogs. And they are wearing seal skin clothing, caribou skin pants, seal skin boots. If it weren't for their sunglasses and the skidoo, this, this photo could have been taken at any point in the past. And what was so neat for us was to, to be part <coughs> excuse me, to be part of a culture, to travel with a culture that was still living off the land to such a large extent. This is what the Inuit guys on our expedition would eat for lunch. We'd pull over and they would pop out a big hunk of frozen raw caribou leg and just saw some pieces of that off with a knife or an axe and pop them into their mouth. This is frozen char. It's in the salmon and trout family and they eat that raw and this is what they've been eating for thousands of years. Their, their diets consisted traditionally of only meat. In the summertime they could get some berries but you know, there's no vegetables that grow up there or anything. And, and they got all the nu nutrition that they needed from the raw meat. <coughs> Sorry, I'm battling with a, a cold here. But uh, they, because they get some of the families still 95 or 98 percent of their food from hunting, they're still very, very intimately connected with the land. And they can see changes before even Western scientists can see changes. Scientists who are, are monitoring these areas, but maybe remotely or, or only coming up in the summers. In fact, the Inuit people were telling Western scientists for a long time that the night, in the, the polar night in the winter when the sun doesn't come above the horizon, it wasn't as dark as it used to be. And they were convinced that maybe something had changed with the orbit of the Earth or the sun or something, but they didn't know what had caused it, but they knew that it wasn't as dark. And all the Western scientists kind of shook their heads and said, that's ridiculous, and when we know that the Earth hasn't changed its tilt on its axis or its orbit enough to, to make it less dark. But then there was a weather station operator who found out that there was a warm layer of air that was reflecting the sun's, refracting the sun's rays over the horizon, much like when you stick a fork into a glass of water and it looks like the tines bend. So it actually was lighter in the polar night. And so these people are out on the land all the time. They notice these changes. And as Sheila Watt Clotier, who's an Inuit leader from Iqaluit and also a Nobel Prize nominee, has pointed out, the Inuit are like the sentinels for the rest of the world. <coughs> They're on the front lines of climate change and they can let us know when things are changing and, and give us an advanced warning. Okay, so dogs. People always ask about the dogs. 
We have Polar Huskies. This is a breed that Will Steger has been developing for years. It's got a bit of Greenland Husky, Inuit Dog, and a little bit of Wolf bred in there as well. They have very long outer guard hairs that shed the snow, and then inner soft hairs that keep them very warm. If it gets up to about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which I think for most of us would still be a little chilly, these dogs start to overheat and they can't really run. Towards the end of our exhibition, we were contemplating running at night in order to keep the dogs a little bit cooler. But they're most happy when it's maybe 20 below zero. That's where they feel the most comfortable and feel like running. We had temperatures that reached 50 below, 60 below, maybe not 60 below, 50 or 55 below <coughs> during the nights. And sometimes it was very windy. And the dogs would just curl up and put their tail over their nose and they'd be absolutely fine through the night. So they're amazing dogs. They love to pull. Here they're howling because uh, we're stopped and that frustrates them. They like to run. Uh, so so that we, there are two teams of Inuit dogs and then two teams of dogs from Minnesota. The Inuit guys run with their dogs in a fan hitch. All of their dogs are on equal length traces or ropes that attach to one central tie out point on the sled. So they run in kind of a fan. And in contrast, the teams from Minnesota run in the tandem hitch, which this might be what's more familiar to you, an image of dog sledding. Uh, can any of you guess why the Minnesota teams run in tandem as opposed to the fan hitch? Trees. Trees, yes. You can imagine if you were running on a narrow trail in Minnesota with your dogs like this. <laughs> you wouldn't get very far. So our dogs are trained to run tandem. And the Inuit guys kept trying to convince us that we wanted to run our dogs in fan hitch because they said it was much more efficient because all the dogs are pulling on one spot on the sled instead of this long rope. And um, we, we didn't take their advice because we thought our dogs would, would freak out if, if they were changed into a, a way that they weren't used to. But I think the Inuit guys might have been right that their way was more efficient because they were always ahead of us. They were so far ahead of us. They were so much faster than we were. We would see them in the morning at hookup, and then they would take off and we would never see them again. <laughs> the only way that we would see them is if they stopped and got out their stoves and made tea and sat down and relaxed. And then maybe we would catch up to them when they were shutting their stove back up and getting to run off again. And uh, it was, it was so, so rushed feeling for our sleds that Abby, the other woman on the expedition, and I had to figure out how to eat and drink and actually had to figure out how to pee while skiing because we couldn't <laughs> stop. If we stopped, we would never see them again. And, and there's polar bears out there and we didn't want to be by ourselves. And so uh, we were always in a rush. The only way that uh, we'd ever catch up to the you know, guys besides tea was if you can imagine this dog over here wants to see this dog and this dog wants to come over here. Eventually the dogs get all tangled up. And maybe two or three times a day, the Inuit guys have to stop and untangle their traces. And, uh, and this, this gives us a chance to catch up and maybe have a snack. But the, the Inuit musher is kind of vulnerable at this particular time because none of the dogs are attached to the sled. So he's relying on his discipline of these dogs for them to lie still. But as I've already mentioned, dogs love to run. And uh, one time when I was on, uh, on Lukey's sled, he was at about this point where he had all of the traces in his hands and then the dogs saw something that they wanted to chase. And all 14 of them took off running. And if, if you've ever taken even one or two dogs for a walk that want to go somewhere, you know how, how strong they are. And Lukey was basically barefoot skiing behind these 14 dogs across the open ice. And he was yelling at these dogs and eventually he got them to stop. And, and we couldn't get them to back up. I think it's impossible to get 14 dogs to go backwards. And so we had to go back and get the sled and push the sled up to where the dogs were and get them hooked back up. So it's always an adventure when you have dogs as your power. But uh, I could tell you all about dog sledding, but nothing beats seeing it. So I'll show you a quick video of one of our more adventurous days of dog sledding. Hello, this is Will Peter here, my third day day. The day of uh, our adventure today, we're coming down through the hills. Uh, we uh, come to the top, we call the valley. And uh, it's a real, real exciting day, uh, many dog hills. There's a couple of techniques of going downhill with a heavy laden dog sled. Uh, if there's deep snow, that has a tendency of breaking the sled, uh, slowing, it up, slowing it down in other words. But you always have a tendency of getting the sled away from the dog so it's not coming right down 
not uh, hitting them. So it's parallel, but going out and uh, about three or four feet off to the side. And then the dogs run separately, and we get real steep areas, and it's about the tendency of catching up with the dogs. And then in other areas, you uh, put brakes, uh, chains, uh, any type of rope, whatever. <laughs> Much slower, so uh, I see any conditions you usually use the brakes. <laughs> and then we got into the canyon. Uh, there's a lot of overflow. Overflow is very typical. Uh, this time of year, the water is flowing down the mountains, uh, it's flowing on the outside of the streams. And especially in these canyons, it collects, so it's always flowing down. It's almost like a hot springs in a way, and we have layers off this ice. And um, we have a very slick surface. A couple problems there is there's water, and then there's a very slick surface, and the dogs are kind of freaked out on the ice, and the kids are biting on the rocks, and then our sleds get all hung up on the rocks, and then the sled went into the water on the side. And it's almost like a dam once we broke through, through the snow, the water, and then pour it out. And the two or three hours we were in that canyon trying to get out of it, that water started flowing, the whole thing was just flowing by the time we got out of there. We all had wet feet. Uh, luckily, it was a warm day, about zero degrees. So 40 below would have been a different story. Uh, but a lot of that might have been frozen up. And, but uh, you always have a, find a way of getting out of it. You look for a while, it's funny how we want to get out of this, but I always know you always find a way. It was getting dark, and uh, one of the sleds with a flash, my flashlight went forward, so I was watching the time, but we got, we got out of there okay. And a little bit of natural reading. Uh, I had a tendency of bringing the team together. Working with Simon on the sled was a really great thing for all of us. He really bonded with us on that and cooperation and working hard together. So it was a really great day yesterday. Well, it's over. I don't think I'm going to go back up there again. Yeah, I don't think so. No. <laughs> So you can you can see that you can have no pride when you're dog sledding. You fall down a lot and, and you get hit by the sled and other adventures. Uh, we did have one adventure on thin ice that I would like to share with you. This happened the first week of May, so we were just near the end of our expedition, and we were we just come off the Barnes ice cap, which is a huge ice cap that's a remnant of the last glaciation, and we got on the headwaters of a river that was frozen, and our plan was to follow that frozen river down to the Fox Basin, which is sea ice, and then cross over the sea ice to Iglulik, our final destination, and then fly home from there. But spring was coming on, excuse me, spring was coming on very quickly quickly. And so we got down to this river and uh, Simon and Lukey went out to check the ice. And, and these men have been traveling on ice their entire lives and their livelihood and their ability to survive depend on their ability to read the ice. So they walked out with their harpoons and they were checking the ice and they were listening to it and they were feeling how their harpoons felt when it hit the ice and looking at it and they could tell that the ice was really not very good at all. And we were trying to figure out what to do because we needed to travel down this river. We could look out at the middle of the river and we could see standing water on top of the ice and, and really thin ice. We knew it was bad out there. But the land wasn't a really good option either because the snow was starting to melt and these big rocks were starting to show through. And when your sled goes up and over the rocks, the sleds have soft plastic shoes on the runners and these rocks put deep gouges in the bottom of the runners and that puts a lot of drag on the sleds and it's hard on the dogs and it slows you down. And so then a couple times a day you have to flip the sled over and take a planer and smooth those runners down. So the Inuit guys are really trying to avoid those rocks if at all possible. So. What Simon decided to do, and, and he was on the lead sled this particular day, and I, I was riding on his sled this day, he decided that he would stay on the river ice, but right next to the rocks, so that if the ice would, hopefully would be thick enough, and, and if it broke, it would be right next to the shore, so it would be really shallow, hopefully, and, uh, and we wouldn't go over the rocks. And so we were kind of hugging the shore, Simon was using his voice commands to keep the dogs over by the rocks, and if they started to stray out into the middle of the river, he'd crack his whip off to the right to scare the dogs back over to the left. He wouldn't hit the dogs with the whip, but just the loud noise would get the dogs back over to the left. This seemed to be going okay, but I could tell that the ice was really bad. I, I've led dog sled expeditions in Ely, and I know a bit about ice reading, and this was pretty easy to read because there were sounds of cracks coming out from the sled, and, uh, and then every once in a while, I was sitting on the back, Simon was on the front, every once in a while, the back runner would punch through a little bit, and water would well up from the ice and, and fill up the tracks of the sled. 
And I was thinking, this is not good. <laughs> but uh, it was a warm day, and I thought, well, you know, we're, we're kind of near the shore, so uh, it, you know, it won't, won't be the end of the world. Uh, but then the, the river, sh- the bank, kind of opened up to the left into a big bay, and the dogs couldn't figure out why Simon wanted them to go way out of their way to hug the shore when they could just cut straight across to the other side. And so Simon yelled to him, but it was a bit too late, and we, um, we fell through. So this is our sled floating right now. Uh, I could see all these air bubbles coming up out of it, and so I knew that there was water getting into all of our stuff and that eventually the sled would stop floating. But, uh, but Simon, he didn't know how deep it was. He was tying up his sealskin boots, which are waterproof, and he was going to step off into what he hoped was shallow water and try and pull the front of the sled up onto the ice in the hopes that his dogs had enough purchase that they could pull the sled out. Uh, well, he stepped off, and it, it didn't matter that he was wearing waterproof boots because he was up to about his thighs in this water. So he got up onto the ice and crawled over to Lukey's sled over here on the shore. Lukey gave him the end of a long rope, and then Simon crawled back over to our sled, holding this rope in his hand. And as he was crawling over the ice, very gingerly, you could see the ice bowing underneath of him. And I was thinking, oh, this is not really very good. But he, uh, he tied one end of the rope to our sled, and Lukey tied the other end of the rope to Lukey's 14 dogs. And I'll show you what happened next. This is a grainy video because it was shot on a little point and shoot and then sent over satellite. So the quality is not that great, but you can see what happens. The sled is just plunging through the ice like an icebreaker, leaving a big trail behind it. <clears throat> and uh, here's the long, long rope. And you'll get a quick glimpse of Lukey's dogs right here pulling. <clears throat> I got a hard time from the other members of the expedition for being a damsel in distress here because I was just sitting on the sled. But, uh, but <laughs> Simon really forcefully told me not to get off the sled, and so I was, I was uh, obeying what he said. But this particular dog here, let me go show it in a second, um, had fallen into the ice and its trace was caught on a jagged piece of ice and it wasn't able to get up and the more the sled pulled, the more this dog was pulled against the ice. But uh, luckily the traces are made <coughs> excuse me, the traces are made out of bearded seal skin that the Inuits chew <coughs> to make into a rope. So it's, it's not like a nylon rope that has a really, really strong load capacity. So it broke uh, when the, it came under pressure and that dog was then free. <coughs> And I, I got off to try and help, and you can hear Simon say, don't get off yet. And uh, but I felt so stupid sitting on the sled. I got off and then was stuck up to my knees in this <clears throat> kind of uh, slushy muck. Uh, but <laughs> eventually we got out. And our only casualties, we were very lucky, our only casualties were our dry gear. Luckily, my gear was on a different sled, so, <laughs> so my gear was completely dry. But you know, here's Will drying out his sleeping pad, and this is Simon wringing out the felt wool inserts of his boots. And uh, we, we were very lucky. It was just gear. It was a very warm day. We had other sleds with us that could help us. It was relatively shallow. And it wasn't a very dangerous situation, more just inconvenient. But um, it made me think about how other people aren't so lucky up there. Every village where we visited, we'd talk to people who shared stories of hunters going through the ice and being lost. There was a hunter named Simon Nottuck who I interviewed in a Caliwip. He's one of the most respected elders of his community, a very skilled hunter, and he was in his probably early 60s, so he, he definitely knows the trails and, and can read ice. And he was out a couple years ago on his snowmobile on a hunting trail over the ice that he's been using his entire life. And in his headlamp, in his headlight, the ice looked the same as it always had. It looked fine. But he thinks that warm ocean currents were eroding the ice from underneath, so that although it looked fine to him, it was not fine, and his sled plunged through the ice. He was by himself. His sled went down. He lost his cell phone and his radio, any way to contact people. Everything, sorry, everything he was wearing was wet, and he buried himself in a snowbank in the hopes that it would insulate him until someone could rescue him. 
He was there for two days without any food or water and soaking clothes with temperatures that I imagine were 40 below or, or colder. When he was finally rescued, he was taken to Ottawa and they had to amputate both of his legs from just below the hips down. And uh, when he was talking to me uh, through a translator, he speaks only in Nuktatut, he was hoping that our expedition could help spread the word, help spread his story, because he's convinced that climate change is happening rapidly and that people aren't really paying attention to what's happening in the polar regions because they seem so remote. And his hope is that his story can help put a human face on the issue of climate change so that people will realize it's happening now and it's affecting people. So our little falling through the ice wasn't really that big of a deal. Another thing that I thought about with this falling through the ice was how spring was coming on so rapidly and it was on a small scale, the same process as happening on a global scale with the rapid warming that we're experiencing. Because for the most of our expedition, the snow cover was fine and it didn't seem to be melting very much at all. And then as soon as these black rocks started to stick through, the snow just started to disappear. We were worried that we were going to be dog sledding just over gravel and that we might have to call for a boat to come pick us up because we might not be able to cross the sea ice. The, the dark, as you know, absorbs the heat more rapidly, just like being out in the summertime heat with a black shirt on versus a white shirt. So once they started to, those black rocks started to show through, they absorbed heat, they melted more snow, more rocks showed through, which absorbed more heat, which melted more snow, so it's this positive feedback loop. And you could see all these little plants just starting to poke through so quickly. And uh, it occurred to me that this is what's happening on a larger level with the oceans and with the Arctic sea ice. <clears throat> Incoming solar radiation, about 90% of that radiation can reflect off of ice. And about 90% of it can be absorbed by dark ocean water. And so as more ice melts, more heat is absorbed into the ocean, which melts more ice, and eventually you end up with an ice-free ocean. And the significance of this becomes pretty apparent when you look at the globe from the polar view. This was in 1979 in September, which is a good time for measuring ice extent because it's normally the smallest ice extent of the year. So in 79, we had this amount of ice. And then by 2003, we were down to this amount. Um, for those of you who were paying attention this year, 2007 was drastically reduced ice. It shocked even the people who had, had, uh, had been studying it and had been doing projections. But just looking here at the difference between 79 and 2000, you can see that in my lifetime, we've lost maybe a third of, of the ice cover on the Arctic Ocean. And when you think about the fact that all this white should be reflecting the radiation and now it's dark and it's absorbing the radiation, you can understand the implications this has for the global climate as our entire globe starts to heat up with this feedback loop set in motion. All right, one more story about ice. Uh, this one happened crossing the Cumberland Sound. Again, we started here in Acaluit and crossed the Hall Peninsula and we're on our way to Pengertung. The Cumberland Sound is about 120 miles across and people have lived around the sound for thousands of years and they've got hunting camps all the way along here. There's a village here and the, the people traditionally have crossed the sound on their snowmobiles and dog teams to visit their hunting camps. There's also a vibrant turbot fishing industry on the ice. People have long lines through the ice and, and they've got ice fishing shacks out there. So the people of Pangertung really rely on the ice of Cumberland Sound. Well, this past year, here's a satellite image of uh, Cumberland Sound on the 28th of January. Our, our dog teams came through, I think, March 10th. And you can see that on the 20th of January, this huge fracture happened on the ice. And then um, by the middle of February, <clears throat> all of that old ice had blown out into sea and was replaced by very thin ice with big cracks through it. You can tell that you would not be able to cross this in a snowmobile. When our base camp support team flew over on the 9th of March, this is what the sound looked like. Just big pancakes of, of fragmented ice and big open leads. There would be no way to travel across this. So the dog teams, when they came through, had to hug the shore. And even so, the ice that the dog teams had traveled on, two days after they arrived in Painterton, broke up and blew out to sea. And uh, so that was kind of a, a close call for the expedition. <clears throat> if we had had to be rescued by boat with all these dogs, it could have been a really desperate situation. But talking with the people in Pangertung, these are things that they're dealing with all the time. This one guy told me that his ice shack 
had broken up, and the ice that it was on had broken up and floated away, and his relatives who live in Greenland found it, it washed up on their shore in Greenland. And so uh, of, of all the turbot fishermen in Pangertung, only one or two were out fishing this year, uh, and well, that's just a fraction of the, the normal amount that go out fishing, because they just didn't think it was worth it to go out there and, and possibly need to be rescued. Um, the Inuit people also travel uh, overland, and they use these Anuk trips to, um, to navigate. Uh, people ask about polar bears, so I will tell a little story about polar bears. I don't know if you can see, very faintly, there's a track here, another one here, one here. I took this picture from the sled as I was going by. Uh, at this point, we hadn't seen any polar bears yet. These were the first tracks we saw. And it made me a little bit nervous, so I looked over my shoulder a little bit. Uh, each one of our sleds had a shotgun on the sled that was in a case that was pretty easy, accessible, and it was loaded with a couple cracker shells because you don't want to kill the bear if you can avoid it. Uh, you want to scare it away. You don't want to be eaten. Uh, but then behind the cracker shells, there were a couple slugs in case the bear was difficult to convince that it wanted to leave. Um, but we had uh, one of those guns on each one of the sleds, and it was funny, Richard Branson, being from England, I think, doesn't uh, necessarily see shotguns on a daily basis. <laughs> and so he had been on the expedition for several days before he noticed the shotgun on the sled, and he said, is, is that a gun? And we said, yes, it is. And he was like, oh. Oh, is that, is that so you can get food? And we said, no, that's so we don't become food. And he was like, oh! <laughs> Looked around a bit. But uh, you know, these shotguns, <clears throat> you can't bring them into the tent because the tent is warm. And the warm to cold, warm to cold, they'll start to ice up and they won't work when you need them. So we would always leave our shotguns in the vestibule of each tent. And then you know, we'd be all cinched down in our sleeping bag. And polar bears are pretty smart about hunting humans. And I've heard a lot of stories from Inuit hunters of, of polar bears jumping on top of tents, knowing that there's humans inside. And, and so we were thinking, OK, we're all cinched up in our sleeping bags, and our gun is in the vestibule. So what are we supposed to do? And so what, what we did was we attached our dogs in a big square around our tent in the hope that the dogs would wake up first and they would bark. And that would give us enough time to wake up and get out of our sleeping bags and get into the vestibule and get the gun out of the case and, and get ready for the polar bears. But we hadn't had any polar bears for most of the expedition. It was getting on to where it was almost 24, day, 24 hour daylight. And about 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning when it was kind of this half light, all of our dogs started to bark. And uh, my tent mate, Abby, and I were lying there in our sleeping bags. And I said, did you hear that? And she said, yeah. And we thought, well, maybe we had this one dog that was in heat. And there was another dog that had no neck. And so he could basically like get out of his collar and go visit this other dog, his girlfriend. And then all the other dogs would get really excited about that. And we thought, well, maybe that's what's going on. But it just kept going on. And then we started to hear some tent zippers and some, some shotgun case zippers. And we heard some footsteps. And we heard some of the Inuit guys say, polar bear. And we thought, really? So we hopped out of our sleeping bags and we were, um, ooh, sorry, I wasn't going to show that just yet. <laughs> but I thought there was another slide. But anyway, so we're standing in our tents and we're, uh, we're looking off into the distance. In fact, I think maybe that's the next slide. Yeah, there we go. Oops. <laughs> another another um, sneak preview of what's coming next. So uh, this, is, this is me in the half light and my teammate, Abby, and we're staring off into the distance. And uh, my eyes are kind of blurry because I'm still half asleep. And I'm staring at these, this rubbled sea ice. And I, there's this one piece of ice that looks kind of like a polar bear in the way distance. And Abby's saying, do you see it? And I was like, yeah, I think I, think I see it. And, uh, and then this bear uh, kind of walked out behind a tent. It was just kind of blocked. It's, uh, this tent was blocking our, our line of sight to this bear. And it was maybe 25 yards from our dogs. And I said, oh, yeah, I see it. There it is right there. And uh, the Inuit guys estimate that this bear is six or seven year old male, weighs about a thousand pounds. And uh, it was very interested in dog for dinner. Apparently, polar bears like to come into camps and, and eat sled dogs. And uh, so he was pretty interested in us. And um, our dogs, I think, knew that. This is our dog, Bones. And uh, Abby and I, every night of the expedition, would stake Bones right here. Our heads in the tent are right about here. And we'd stake Bones right there because he was a big alpha male and really aggressive. And we thought, he will protect us from the polar bears. But as you can see, he's cowering behind our tent right here. So maybe he wasn't the best choice of a dog uh, to be back there. But uh, luckily, we had people on our expedition who are pretty familiar with polar bears. And one of them is John Stetson. 
So uh, he's a <laughs> yeah. He's a, he spent a lot of time in Churchill, where there's a lot of polar bears who are pretty habituated to humans. So he's uh, out there in his down booties and his boxer shorts, and uh, he nonchalantly shot a cracker shell towards this polar bear. And he's very careful to make sure that the cracker shell lands between us and the polar bear, so it'll explode and scare the bear away from us, as opposed to shooting the cracker shell over the bear, so it lands behind it and explodes, and it runs right into your camp. So he shot this first shell perfectly, and it exploded. And Maybe the bear jumped, but not really. It didn't really seem very concerned about the cracker shell. And uh, John's second cracker shell is this one that's supposed to be this crazy cracker shell that the bears have never seen before, and they're going to freak out, and like spins and sparks and loud noises. And So Stetson shot that at the bear, and it jumped and went back about 20 yards, and then thought, well, that's all you've got? <laughs> Doesn't seem like much of a problem. And so then it started to kind of run back towards the camp again. And... Uh, I, I was still hoping that everything was going to be fine, and but talking with Abby later, my tent mate, she said that through her head, she was thinking, oh, what a majestic animal. I'm so glad we have a chance to see it. I hope they don't kill, kill it! Kill it! <laughs> but uh, luckily, luckily, we didn't have to kill it. Uh, because Lukey, who is probably a 65-year-old Inuit guy, one of the most spry, strong, brave, uh, knowledgeable, wise outdoors people uh, that I've ever had the privilege of traveling with, he is so familiar with polar bears, he knows exactly what to do. He has a gun that you can't see here, but he basically ran directly at the polar bear, full speed. You can kind of see he's running here. And uh, the bear must have thought, you know, this guy is crazy. He's running at a polar bear. So the bear turned around and ran off. And I was so grateful yet again for the opportunity to travel with Inuit people who know this area and know the animals and, uh, and what to do in these situations. I was very fortunate. Um, the polar bear population in Baffin is doing quite well. Um, the ice around there is still pretty good. And there's been some reports of bears being a little skinnier, but it's not really confirmed. There's been some reports of, of more bears coming into towns to get food out of the dumps. But uh, again, they, they seem to be doing quite well. Polar bear populations in other areas, however, are not doing so well. This is a picture of a starved to death polar bear that Will took last August when he was in Greenland. Will also has some footage from that trip of bears eating each other and of bears eating their cubs. And he won't show that footage publicly because uh, it's pretty graphic and disturbing. But uh, Will estimated that this bear weighed about 300 pounds or so at the time of its death, and it should have weighed about 1,000. So there are definitely areas where polar bears are having a hard time getting enough food because they rely on the ice to hunt. And polar bears are a charismatic species that everybody pays attention to, but it's not just the polar bears that are being impacted by the changing climate, by the ice forming up later in the spring or in the fall and breaking up later in the spring. It really affects the entire ecosystem up there, and so uh, it's, it's something that we should continue to, to pay attention to. Um, I have uh, a video of a storm, but I think I'm going to just skip that. Maybe I'll just show you the very beginning of it in the interest of time so you can get an idea for the wind. We're here on March 19th. Uh, really good storm today. Uh, we didn't have much of a choice to make it Yeah, so uh, it was windy. <laughs> and, uh, and you could actually... Uh, go out onto the ice in that wind and you would just get blown down the ice. You couldn't even stand up. Um, getting into camp the day before, <clears throat> I was on the sled with Stetson. He's a pretty gruff guy. He expects results. And uh, we're trying to get the dogs to run on glare ice into this probably 60 mile an hour wind. Or so, and They really didn't want to do it. And so Stetson was saying, get out there and pull the dogs forward. Run the dogs forward. And, and everyone else was wearing mucklucks, which are these shoes that are perfect for Arctic travel. They've got this soft kind of rubbery sole that has good traction on the ice. But uh, I'm recovering from a foot injury and I need a little bit more support than mucklucks offer. So I was wearing these military mouse boots, these big vapor barrier rubber boots. And I think that they were frozen solid like hockey pucks because I had absolutely no traction and I couldn't even stand up. I would try and stand up and I would just get blown backwards past the sled and past Stetson. And he would watch me get blown down the ice and he would be screaming at me, what are you doing? Get back out there! And, uh, and he, he just couldn't figure out why I, I couldn't stand up. And then when we got to camp, he changed out of his mucklucks and he put on some different boots and then was getting blown down the ice as well and then he realized and he and kind of in his own way apologized for yelling at me all day about that. But uh, anyway, it was, it was quite the storm and, and again, it, it helped me appreciate the knowledge and the expertise of the Inuit people who've lived in this culture for 4,000 years without the benefit of modern technology.
So I don't want to leave you on a depressing note talking about dying polar bears and, and receding ice. Um, James Hansen, who's a NASA scientist who's received quite a bit of press lately, he, he says it's not too late, but we do need to act now. And there are technologies, there are methods of conservation and other things that together, uh, you know, Al Gore calls it not a silver bullet, but maybe silver buckshot. There's enough technologies out there that with the, the willpower and with the, the motivation and the dedication, we can stabilize the atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide at a level that may be able to avoid um, catastrophic human-induced climate change, but we do need to, to act. And, and this is what kind of uh, fascinates me, is, is how do we get motivated to act? And when I was up in the Arctic, I had a lot of time to sit on the sleds and think about this question. And you know, it's funny, when I went up there, I was expecting to interview the Inuit people and get these stories of these people who were facing a, a very desperate challenge to their culture and their ability to survive. And uh, I, I hadn't really thought about what implications or what lessons I could, I could take back to my home yet. Uh, but when I would ask the Inuit people, well, what are you going to do if you can no longer hunt in the traditional way that you have done? Uh, how are you going to pass your culture on? How will your culture survive? And, and almost without exception, the Inuit people would say, we're very resourceful. It's one of the characteristics of being Inuit. We've been living in this harsh climate for 4,000 years by cooperating and through community um, work and we'll be able to adapt to this. And already several Inuit communities have relocated. Um, they've had to adjust their hunting and the way that they teach their young people. But uh, they would tell me, we're very resourceful, we'll be able to survive. But then they would ask me, do you think that your culture is gonna be able to move your communities that are by the coast? And do you think that your culture is going to be able to easily adjust the way that you produce food and transport food? And this um, was kind of a humbling question. I thought, well, maybe, uh, maybe we do need to start thinking about this right away. Uh, but then I started to think about human motivation and thinking about um, how difficult it is to work towards something if the only reason you're working towards it is out of motivation of, of fear of trying to avoid something that's really horrible. And wouldn't it be more pleasant to work towards something out of motivation for a vision that's very beautiful? And then I started to think about this. And I'm looking at the Inuit clothing and gear. Here are their harnesses. They're made out of bearded seal skin. Their traces are made out of bearded seal. These are the toggles that attach their traces to the sleds. They're carved out of bone. Everything that the Inuit people were wearing, everything their sleds were made out of, you could eat if you wanted to. It was all very natural. It all came straight from their environment, and it all made sense for their local area. And then in contrast, I looked at our sleds, the sleds from Minnesota, and we had these brightly colored nylon outfits, and we had this plastic rope, and we'd stop for lunch, and we'd take out our plastic bags full of macadamia nuts that we'd flown in from Hawaii or whatever. And I was thinking, well, we're not really very locally smart here. And, and then I started to think about being from Iowa, living in the Midwest, Maybe we could start to think about local solutions that make sense for us. And this might be a beautiful uh, vision to work towards. And I'm not saying we should all start hunting and making our own clothing and, and living off the land. I don't think that makes sense for us. But maybe we can start looking at wind power or um, solar power or biofuels or growing our own crops and, and trying to eat more locally. And, and this might be a vision that is inspiring and, and something that people would like, even if it didn't help with global warming because knowing your neighbor is a nice thing, knowing the people who produce your food, working together with your, your families, your communities, your churches on projects is, is something that people enjoy. And perhaps we could be more empowered if instead of thinking, wow, there's this huge global, global problem, we've got to reduce our emissions by you know, 80% or something, and, and how can I do that as an individual? That can be uh, overwhelming, but thinking about it as a community and, and again being inspired by the Inuit's strong community to get together with friends and, and raise money for a wind turbine at a coffee shop or solar panels for your school or a green roof on campus or, or some project like that could be a more inspiring way to move forward in, in a vision that's beautiful and, and not just moving because we're motivated by fear. So with that, I would uh, encourage you to visit our website. Uh, you can read a recap of the last expedition. We also have another expedition leaving for the high Arctic, uh, Ellesmere Island, north of Baffin, in April. I'm not going on that, but I'm writing some of the curriculum for that expedition. Uh, and you can follow us there. There's also um, some maps 
up here if you'd like to pick up one before you leave, if you enjoy maps. Uh, or if you know someone who does, here's a map of Bathroom and then also some information about the Inuit and the Arctic ecology on the back. So with that, um, let's take a few questions. You can ask about anything, whether it's expedition related or, or global warming related. Yes? How did you end up uh, on the expedition? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I introduced myself to Will at a book signing and gave him my resume and cover letter and uh, asked if I could come on the expedition. <laughs> and I think that he was a little bit taken aback, as were all the other people standing in line at the book signing. <laughs> but, uh, but he called later and we met up for coffee and I've had had a bit of experience dog sledding for Outward Bound, and that helped. And also my, my research interests at the University of Minnesota are in how to use expeditions to educate people about global warming and other environmental issues, and so it seemed like a really good fit there. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe one or two more questions, and then I hopefully can get you out of the door by eight. Yes? How did you train the That is a good question as well. Um, we had to train the dogs, and we just got physically strong in the course of training the dogs because we'd have to take them out every day and at the beginning our lead dogs were horrible and they would not follow the trail and if a rabbit ran across the road they would take off into the woods after the rabbit and so you had to do a lot of running in front of the dogs trying to get them to follow you and, and so just by taking the dogs out for several hours a day we got fit and then when the expedition started we weren't going long distances at the beginning and we eventually as the dogs got in more shape and we got in better shape by the end we were going maybe 30 miles a day so it was definitely a, a progression up to being ready for that Yes. Did you ever get a chance to meet Susan Butcher? I have not met Susan Butcher. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Susan Butcher is a well-known Iditarod musher who I believe died of breast cancer last year. Last year. And yeah, I did not have a chance to meet her, fortunately. Great. Um, well, I appreciate you coming. And um, please feel free and talk to me afterwards if you have to.